forward of the engines are two huge turbo pumps which suck water directly from under her hull and then fire it out through her gigantic water cannon or through hoses. The flow is controlled by valves, but they've been jamming, hence the need for Jerry's strip down. But on first inspection, the valves seem to be fine. All I can see is gate valve. Gate valves are a kind of tap. The gate itself is a flat disc of metal mounted on a threaded shaft. When the wheel is turned at the top, the gate travels up and down the shaft, just like a nut going up and down a bolt. Moving the disc up and down the shaft opens or closes the valve, just like a giant gate. Nobody said it was going to be easy. In all, there are 13 of these giant valves on board, and they've not been apart for years. Only when he pulled the lot out did old Jerry finally work out what was making them jam. Dave told us there was a problem with these valves, and I pulled every single one in the engine room, been through them, and they don't look too bad, except on closer inspection. The thread here doesn't look too bad, does it? Nice and square, good and solid. OK, it's a bit manky at the end, but look at this. Complete sections broken off, and I reckon if I whack this with a hammer, the whole lot will fall away. This isn't metal anymore. Most likely corrosion caused by seawater. See, it's absolutely beggared. And I promise you, I'm not cheating. If I hit the rest of it, nothing happens. Finding out what is wrong is progress of sorts. Whilst Jerry had worked out the gate valve problem, the engine team had finished stripping down the Glenifer and we found she had a touch of mechanical arthritis on her big and little ends, the point where the connecting rod from the piston meets the crankshaft. These bearings take all the thrust of the pistons and spin at thousands of revs per minute. Well, the engine's in a lot more bits than it was when um, you last saw it. Yeah. Yeah, we're winning, Joe. Well... Apart from the bearings, that's what we found. Oh, wow, right. This is the best one. Yeah, there's plenty of white metal on that, but that thing is absolutely through to the copper. Each of the bearings should have a coating of white metal between it and the crankshaft itself. The idea is that the softer white metal will wear out instead of the expensive components, and our problem is that the white metal is long gone. So we're going to need a new set. Yeah. That's the bottom line, new set. Is that bad? It's bad. You can't just buy them off the shelf. You have to have them specially made. So, oh. but there's a man out there who can do it. All right. I'll find him. I well, have one of these. Cheers. 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 Hard work, but bloody good. Wood worth it, mate. Next morning, fully sobered up, I took our sick bearings to meet Colin Thornton of Hoyt Darsham, a true alchemist if ever there was one. I've got the bearings here from the Massa Shore. And, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, no. but they're very, they're looking very thin to me. Yeah, what, what you've got here is a bronze backing and yeah. a white metal layer on the front. Right, the so this, the shaft is actually yeah, worn the shaft, away. the shaft has worn some of it away, yeah. and just put in fresh material. And then build it back up. Build it back up again. Yeah. Okay. The technique is to cast a new layer of white metal on the inside of each of the bearings. It's not done much these days, so Colin is one of the few who's still got the skills. We're going to heat it up and heat hopefully it up. all the white the... metal will dribble out. Yeah, yeah well, it is. The, 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 gently melt the surface. The first thing to do is to melt off any old metal and other impurities from the body of the bearing. It goes pretty quick once it starts to go. Most of what metal's now gone. Hyperclean, the bearing can now be dipped in molten tin to provide a key for the white metal itself. This may splash a little bit. Okay. Warm your tools up first. If we just threw it, sort of threw it in cold, there'd be a big bang. There would be a big bang. Lots of splashes and bangs. Right. Can I have a go? Yeah, of course you can. Yes. Preheat all the tools. That's it. Just put them in. Yeah. If I drop it, I'm not going in after it. I'm no, afraid. we'll get out one way yeah. or another. And that's because just liquid metal in there. That's molten metal. Molten metal. <laughs> that's it. You just leave there for a few seconds. Oh, I feel like a witch. Just turn off it. Easy, the next stage is to put the freshly covered bearing in a mould. 
All I'm doing here, mate, is keeping out your way. You yeah. Then pour in the white metal alloy to form a thick layer around the bearing. The critical thing is to make sure there are no bubbles in the metal, as that will cause it to break up when it's in use. That's just one. That's just one. We've, we've got another 15 of these to yeah, go. Another 15 to go, yeah. I've got the bearings completely recovered in white metal, and now I've just got to take them off to get them made to measure for our engine. Six. And the tailor of metal who's going to make those bearings fit? Nine. With kid engineer Colin Dinsdale. Six. Hopefully what we'll end up with is a really nice, good fit. Yes. But, uh, with the bearings and the crankshaft. That's right. And it will be over there, and you'll have a minimal clearance there, just to take a bit of oil, but the white metal will... Um, will take the thrust. Mm -hmm. As the crank was so old and worn, we had to measure each bearing individually before machining them to fit. Three, three inch and five. Right then, five Colin. Thou. Shall we go and rig these up so we can actually start machining off yes, sure the then. excess metal? Yes, we will. So when we've trimmed that up, it'll sit beautifully, hopefully, on that's, the crankshaft. That's right, that's it. That's what we're aiming for. That's it. If we'd set the machine up even a thousandth of an inch out, our shiny new bearing would have become scrap in seconds. Whilst we were getting our bearings right, Jerry was about to get in a spin with the gate valve spindles. Using a monster lathe, the plan is to turn a solid lump of bronze into a finely cut thread. This is our gate valve shaft and it's completely knackered. And it's fallen upon me to make a new one, which is going to be a real pig of a job. Now, I know some people like to knock old Jerry, but turning a thread like this is kind of tough, and it's what sorts out the men from the boys in the turning business. Just a shame Jerry's a boy when it comes down to it. Oh! A hundred quid of the bronze, and I yanked the wrong lever. Simple as that. And look. What? And I've just knackered it. Red-faced and well-miffed, the poor boy had to start again. Oh, well, here we go again. Follow it, though, Matthew Shaw, getting her ready to take centre stage at the London Boat Show. She was a massive undertaking for the squad. And whilst Jerry and I attended to the metalwork with varying degrees of success... Oh. Axel and boat builder Julian Kingston were getting on with the woodwork, repairing the huge wooden rubbing strakes, the nautical equivalent of bumpers that run along her hull. The old ones had done 70 years of graft and were rotten to the core. They're massive lumps of wood, four inch thick oak, a wood not famous for being bendy until it gets all steamed up. What the steaming process does is it softens the wood to a point where it, it really is quite surprising. It's, um, it's more like a large lump of rubber. Right. And then the theory is that you can clamp it into position and once it's cooled, it'll hold that shape. Before they could bend anything, Axel had to tear out the old ones. But like everything else on this boat, they just didn't want to go. Look, even the bar's bending. That's not a tool. This is a tool. While Axel grappled with the old timber, Julian prepared a new piece of oak ready to be steamed. I will not be beaten! The trick is to sweat the oak inside the makeshift steamer until it gets all bendy. This is the so-called steamer, yes. Piece of industrial ducting. Works wonders. It should only take a couple of hours for the stiff oak to be soft enough to bend round the steep curve at the front of the boat. The insulation keeps the heat in to make sure that the steam at the far end of the duct doesn't condense into water, resulting in a half-cooked plank. Get that over there. Guess what, five? Two hours? Indeed. Time for a cup of tea, I think. 
never had a better ride. According to Julian, a couple of hours in his magic ducting and we'd be laughing. Well, Sug certainly was. Hello, everyone. Hi there. Hi, Sugs. You, you alright? Yeah, mate. What's with the big sausage maker on the jetty there? That's lunch, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now, what it is, um, the steaming, the steaming the plank we're going to put on. After about two hours, when it's sort of pickled right through, it'll come out like um, rubber, we hope. Mm. You wouldn't be able to bend it otherwise, obviously. No, no, you couldn't. No, no, no. It you does look it. like top of the range technology, that. Oh, absolutely, towels. yes. Thunder, you know, really <laughs> cutting edge. <laughs> Is there anything you need me to do? Don't hesitate. I'd like to have the telegraph, please. What, the crossword? No, no, the ding-ding bit. I shall show you. Come on then, Jerry. <laughs> OK. Oh, I'll go fishing then. <laughs> Unlike a modern boat where the skipper has all the controls in the wheelhouse, the Massey's engines are controlled by an engineer in the engine room responding to commands via the telegraph system. The bells alert the engineer and the arrow tells them what the skipper wants. They adjust the engine accordingly, then use the telegraph system to tell the wheelhouse they've obeyed their commands. Right, Suggs. Telegraphs. You move this lever here. The engineer in the engine room hears you. Hopefully responds by moving his lever. And this little lever comes round here, tells you that he's heard, and then hopefully he'll do something with the pumps or the engine that you've asked him to do. Why not shout that to him, Jack? Got two dirty great big Glenith for diesels giving it bom 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 bom. He's gonna hear nothing in there, so he needs a loud indication with the bell and a visual indication with the lever. Jesus, I wouldn't fancy being down here crossing the English Channel. All right, Jerry. Okay, Suggs, I'm gonna start with port side engine on the left there. Go on. That's working lovely, that one. Respond, please. Okay, bell's good here. Next, other side. Yes. Yeah, that sounds fine as well. Tight or sloppy? A little bit loose, yeah, a little bit rattly. Right, same here. To the pumps now. No, that one, nothing. No bells, nothing. No, it is moving. While Suggs and Jerry were playing at Notre Dame, it was the moment of truth for Julian's contraption. Two hours in the steamer should have transformed the stiff oak into a bendy plank that would fit around the Massey's curves. But every moment it was out in the air, the plank was getting stiffer again. Speed was essential. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Right, let's go. That's it. Down a, back in, down a bit. Jerry, pull the rope in. That's it. 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 The thick oak bent beautifully, restoring the graceful curves to the Massey's bow. Good stuff. I really didn't think it was going to bend that far. <laughs> didn't I didn't, no. Know. no. Especially this last bit, that was excellent, really yeah. good. And it's gone in sweet as anything. Well done, yeah. well done, the two oh. Good job, well done. Cheers, mate. Well